Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, Rick, for putting this together. It's been a really interesting day. I hope I won't poop the party with this, but <laughs> you never know. Poop the party. All right. Okay, so uh, 53 mRNA, the other, yeah, I have to speak in this, uh, the other side of the coin. Um, so, uh, you know, if you think about gene expression, you're going back a little bit in time, uh, so the RNA translation or translation of mRNA had this uh, pretty good time period in the 60s and 70s, and then it was overshadowed by um, uh, transcription uh, studies and later by or the, the role of chromatin modeling, and of course, then again, uh, after that came the role of, of uh, protein processing and degradation. And but now, uh, mRNA translation has uh, renewed interest, and there's a lot of uh, uh, reports coming out showing that there's the poor correlation between the levels of RNA and the levels of the uh, translated protein. But without getting too philosophical about this, I just want to point out one paper I, I cited here. It says uh, the protein abundance is predominantly regulate, regulated ribosome. And I chose this one because in the end of it is a footnote saying that while this uh, manuscript were being uh, reviewed, there was another one coming out saying that uh, in dendritic cells has been just been shown that the levels of RNA is regulated on level of transcription. But... Uh, I think it's difficult. I mean, obviously, you can't just control expression of a protein or of an RNA without even looking at the, uh, the stability, right? So um, expression equals synthesis minus, minus degradation. So perhaps now the pendulum has swung a little bit too far back again. Um, so what if these studies, you know, these are omic studies showing that the... Uh, this poor correlation between uh, RNA levels and, and protein expression. But what, what's missing in this is that how individual mRNAs are translated and regulated, right? So the classical model of uh, the canonical translation is that you have the AF4E binding the cap structure and attracting 4G4A, making the 4F complex, and then VIEF3 and so forth, you, you get the pre. Um, the pre-initiation complex, which then scan the RNA, finding the AUG, AUG and off goes uh, translation, right? So there's not really much room in this to see how individual mRNAs are regulated, okay? I mean, there are lots of things in the three prime UTR and so forth going on, but recently, the, from the group of um, Ruggiero, I think it's in the uh, University of San Francisco, showed that mice in which uh, uh, one of the allele had been taken out, show uh, really nice 50% uh, uh, less expression. They have a specific phenotype which is rela related to mRNA expressing protein in the uh, oxidative stress pathway. And based on this model, who can have thought so? And for also for uh, mice lacking regulatory factors which control this interaction with 4G and 4E, the 4E D1, they have neural. Uh, phenotype. So perhaps there's much more in this model than we think. Right? There, we, maybe we have drawn two general conclusions looking at just a few mRNAs. Another way of uh, controlling translation of specific mRNAs is via structures. Right? So this is called uh, internal um, ribosome entry size, whereby you bypass the uh, 4F complex, the cap binding complex, and you load the uh, uh, pre-initiation complex directly to the RNA. Now, this is regulated by iris transactivation factors, so-called ITAF, and they either control the folding of the RNA or they can actually help to attract the 40 complex. But the ITAFs have been described so far are general RNA binding protein. And again, there's not that much insight into see how individual mRNAs are regulated in terms of translation. The best examples comes from um, how structured individual mRNAs are regulated. Actually, come from prokaryotes, it's the riboswitches. So there you have metabolites binding to the nascent mRNA, changing the structure how they fold it, and thereby control the expression of uh, metabolic active enzymes. And the riboswitches consist of an aptamer and then the switch function, right? And because they're aptamers, 
you know, RNA aftermath, you can actually change the specificity of the, uh, of the metabolic compound or the uh, metabolite that you, you are interested in. So this is a um, uh, synthetic riboswitch for theophyllin, and that has been involved into uh, the DNT, recognize the DNT, so you can see how it turns on and off. And this then allows, I mean, in prokaryotes, it allows the cells to rapidly respond to changes in the, uh, um, in the environment. But this is a field that is evolving quite quickly. I mean, the first ribose switches were described in early 2000, and now it's recognized as a major regulatory event in prokaryotes. And this is, it goes on, and I, I, and I just have to mention this one. I think it's quite interesting. So this is for sure from Southern California. It's a, um, it's the, they generate riboswitch which specifically recognize cocaine, right? And then they manage to put it on the electrodes, and then they can detect the, the presence of uh, cocaine in looking at the electric uh, currents flowing through here. So, and this riboswitch that works outside the cell, obviously, it can be reused about 100 times. So it's quite impressive. So these are, again, these are uh, uh, structures or a protein interaction regulated in translation that comes from the, from the five prime UTRs. But what about the coding sequence of mRNA? Do they have anything um, um, to add in terms of translation regulation? So uh, it's been shown quite recently that synonymous mutations in, can drive, uh, can act as driver mutations. So that perhaps they're not so silent as we think, and we try to call them perhaps whisper mutations. So one of the things one would like to know is that how or silent mutations should explain this uh, mutation which do not change the uh, amino acid uh, or the peptide sequence within the coding sequence. So one way they can do is they can change the, uh, the stability of the mRNA. Interesting though, People have actually looked for them to see if they can change the binding of microRNA, but so far there's no evidence of that. And splicing is, of course, another obvious factor. So uh, another way that comes out is quite interesting, another type of mechanism that comes from the work of Judith Friedman's group, um, where she showed that uh, the rate of translation of the nascent chain of protein, which is supposed to be hooked up with the SRP sequence for uh, targeting to the uh, ER is regulated by uh, uh, the presence of uh, rare codons. So as you change the rare codons, you have a more rapid speed of translation, they won't interact with the SRP. A similar concept was introduced in 2007, where they found that the multidrug resistant gene, by changing uh, codon from uh, non-rare to rare codon, they could change the substrate specificity of these enzymes. And also an interesting uh, study, which comes from, uh, is from prokaryotes, of course, is that they say from the same mRNA, they get two population of proteins, which are clearly distinguished both in terms of uh, activity and, and, and biochemical properties. And uh, that uh, which of these proteins should be expressed can be changed just by changing the levels of tRNA in the cells. And if this is also true in mammalian cells, it's quite interesting because the tRNA levels is quite different in different types of tissue. It can be a tenfold difference. So what we are interested in this is come from uh, this 120 nucleotide sequence of the P53 mRNA. Uh, it's between the initiation of the full length P53 and that of the P5347. So this region uh, is actually uh, play a role in the response to endoplasmic reticulum stress and unfolded protein response and in the DNA damage. And I will try to show you how this takes place. So this consists of three stem loop structures, right? In, uh, two of them are just adjacent to the AUG codon. And then in the middle, they have the highly conserved box one sequence. So these uh, two initiation codons give rise to the full length P53, of course, and also then to the P47, we call it, later it's been called N delta P53 and so forth. But what's important here is that it lacks the first transactivation domain that we heard about today from Laura. And thereby it also uh, has different activity compared to full-length protein, cannot bind MDM2, and also has different stability. So it turns out that uh, MDM2 binds not only the, the uh, 
the uh, amino acid encoded by this region, but also the RNA itself. Okay. So from the same genomic sequence of P53, you have two MDN2 interaction sites, one peptide and one protein. So if you, we've changed uh, the, the uh, RNA sequence, I will introduce silence mutation in codon 17, 18, 19. We call it the triple mutant, so we don't change the encoding sequence. We get an mRNA which binds better to MDM2. But if we introduce a, a silent mutation found from cancer sample at like codon 22 here, this L22, we lose the binding to MDM2. And then if we look at the rate of P53 synthesis in the presence of MDM2 from these two different mRNA, we see that when there's a high affinity to MDM2, there's a high rate of synthesis, whereas MDM2 have no effect uh, when the mRNA carries this mutation. So the affinity of, M of the 53 mRNA to MDM2 controls the rate of 53 synthesis. So again, what I just showed you is that factors regulate in the RNA. But what about the other way around? Can the RNAs also regulate the, the protein which interacts with And that seems to be the case, and if you use this uh, with a simple assay where you look at uh, wild type 53 or 53, the wild type protein, but expressed on these mRNAs, right? You see that an mRNA which do not uh, bind MDM2 cannot lead to stabilization of P53 protein following DNA damage here using doxorubicin. So we think then that the mRNA by binding to the c terminal ring domain of MDM2 also controls the E3 ligase activity. So this indicates then that MDM2 has a capacity to have two different functions towards P53, depending on the affinity to the P53 mRNA. With a low affinity, MDM2 is a negative regulator in targeting P53 from degradation, as we all know about. But at higher affinity, it seems that it stimulates synthesis and also prevents MDM2 from targeting P53 from degradation. So this <coughs> is, of course, regulated. And it's carried out by the ATM kinase. So ATM, uh, so if you treat cells then with doxorubicin, which causes DNA damage and activates ATM kinase, you see an increase in the affinity of MDM2 to the P53 mRNA. It's prevented if cells are also treated with ATM inhibitors. This can be mimicked if you introduce a phosphomimetic mutation at CN395, which is the phosphorylation sites of MDM2, uh, sort of ATM on MDM2. And doing the in vitro uh, binding assay, we see that the wild type P53 protein has a very low affinity to, MD, uh, to P53 mRNA, whereas the phosphomimetic mutation binds quite well. So in, in addition then to this classical negative feedback model, which we have heard about, is that when the P53 protein binds to MDM2, and then you can uh, get an increase in MDM2, which will then bind to the P53 protein target for degradation, which takes place under normal condition, one can imagine that on a condition of DNA damage, P53 will still induce MDM2 RNA expression, but under these conditions, MDM2 will be phosphorylated by ATM and instead bind the P53 mRNA. So as long as the ATM pathway is active, P53, um, MDM2 will act as a positive regulator of P53. As soon as ATM is shut off, it directly switches to become a negative regulator. And this is a bit interesting in terms of there's recent uh, work from Gigi Lozano's group in which she tested this uh, feedback model. So she took out the uh, P53 binding site in the, in the promoter of MDM2, and, and the results suggest that this feedback is most important in animals after uh, DNA damage. So MDM2 is not doing this by itself. It needs help from its uh, close homolog, MDM4 or MDMX. So MDMX, or MDM4, as you heard called it before, people call it different things, has, say, a highly conserved 53 binding domain. It also has a ring domain, but it doesn't have any ubiquitin ligase activity, at least not towards 53. So eight, uh, MDMX also binds a 53 mRNA with quite similar um, specificity as, um, as MDM2. It's also sensitive to this L22L mutant also needs to be phosphorylated by ATM. In this case, it's on serine 403. However, the binding curve is slightly different from that of, of MDM2, indicating a positive cooperative activity, indicating more than one binding site, that is. So the first clues to our MDM2 might actually, uh, sorry, MDMX might actually help MDM2 in stimulating P53 translation came from this work showing that 
there's actually a weak um, complementary sequence between codon 22 and this codon 41 in, in the peptide RNA. So if you mutate either of these sites, you lose binding to both uh, MDM2 and to MDMX. But surprisingly, if you have this double mutation, so you restore the potential interaction here, now you also restore uh, P53 binding to the RNA. So this uh, indicates that in order for MDM2, perhaps also MDMX, to bind the RNA, it needs the cooperation between two different structures in P53 RNA. Uh, so to test this further, we, we synthesize in vitro a P53 mRNA in the presence of either MDM2 or MDMX. We then take away the, the proteins and then we look at it at the affinity to each of the, pro uh, the two proteins. And what we find is that if the RNA is synthesized in the presence of MDMX, we stimulate the binding of MDM2, but not of MDMX itself. And MDM2 has no effect in these assays. And it turns out in order for uh, MDMX actually to assist in MDM2 mediated binding to P53 mRNA, it has to take place during synthesis. But uh, there was, this is very controversial to suggest for the RNA structural community that a single base pair interaction could change the structure of the RNA. In fact, they were, there was no way in hell they were going to believe that. So we, were, we actually had to do quite a lot of work to show this. And what Anand did is that he labeled, he met, uh, methylated adenosine and single-stranded adenosine and, and cytosine residues in the P53 mRNA using the DMS. So give the cells a quick pulse label of this. And then you do uh, primary extension, and you can see then where the single-stranded modifications are. Right? So this is the wild type P53. And if you look here at, at codon 21, in the presence of an MDMX, which combined the RNA, you get uh, these residues here. This is codon 21. This A and C become single-stranded, whereas codon 22, you lose that. On this side, this A becomes double-stranded. But in this model here, this codon here, uh, this residue here, the uracil cannot be labeled because you can only label cytosine and adenosine, right? So what we did, we did the reverse mutation where we put the adenosine here and the uracil up here. So we call it reverse mutation, right? You see now we don't, we cannot detect this uh, codon 422 anymore, but we still see these uh, residues here become single-stranded. But now we can detect uh, uh, codon 41, this alanine, and you see in the presence of of uh, MDMX, it becomes double-stranded. So it really shows that this model is correct. So what we believe is happening is that one of the first things after in the DNA damage response is that ATM will then phosphorylate MDMX and also MDM2. MDMX will then, on the nascent P53 mRNA, uh, create an interaction between this, the second and the third stem loops, and that then causes an MDM2 binding platform and MDM2 will then, from that platform, uh, stimulate P53 synthesis. So as you see, this is very similar to the ribosuitch concept, except, of course, it's not metabolized, it's phosphorylated proteins. So <clears throat> we're also interested in, in, uh, in the evolutionary aspect of this, because P53 MDM2 interaction is highly conserved and goes back to early metazoans. But now that we have two potential interaction sites of P53, one RNA and one peptide, we're interested to see which one came first. So we used the uh, Siona intestinalis because it's a pre-vertebrate and it's quite interesting model system. And as you see uh, in uh, the P53 part, it has the conserved residues in box one, which are, have been shown to be important to interact with MDM2. On the MDM2 sides, you see the, the, it has the potential of, of binding P53. The conserved residues are there, and it also high, has a highly conserved ring domain. So we first look at the RNA protein interaction. We see that Sione MDM2 does indeed interact with this P53 pro, uh, RNA, but whereas the interaction of the human uh, RNA protein interaction is optimal at, at 30 degrees, in Siona it's optimal at 18 degrees, which is more close to the temperature where this uh, creature lives of the coast of Bretagne. And also the in vitro binding profiles are different depending on the temperature. And this temperature dependence in binding is actually caused by the structure of the RNA. And it could show that in uh, doing the in vitro uh, of this footprint, you see that it's two different patterns, two different structure of the RNA depending on the temperature. And if you do the, 
this DMS labeling on the live Siona embryos, you can see that the RNA actually takes the structure of the 18 degrees. So in the Siona, the RNA acts as a temperature sensitive switch. And uh, this, this is quite, I just want to show you, it's actually a beautiful picture, but a little bit complicated to go in. But here we use the proximity ligation assay to just to show that uh, we uh, using probes against the Siona P53 RNA and antibodies against MDM2. We can see the, the labeling here. We, we, we use mammalian cells to validate our reagents, and we do see the interaction between the RNA and the protein in different segments here. This is a little bit funny here, because here we look at the expression just of P53, and we find that in, in, the, uh, cor uh, in the corona of the cells, and then this, is the, this type of cells has to go into, has been get rid of, uh, go into apoptosis in order for the, for the embryo to develop. And we do see in the, the co-localization of P53 with the tunnel staining. So it's possible that P53 do play a pro-apoptotic role in the development of the embryos. All right, so now looking at the protein-protein interaction, what's interesting here is that we find a very nice interaction between the Siona MDM2 and the human P53 protein, okay? But not Siona against the Siona protein. But uh, if you take short synthetic peptide corresponding to box one, they both from Siona and from the human, they bind very well to the uh, Siona P53. And what's interesting is that these interactions are competed with, with Nutlin, uh, the high uh, similar uh, efficacy. So that indicates that MDM2 is really highly conserved and can really bind this Nutlin molecule, even from Siona. And we're now testing if it's possible that the uh, flanking region of box one in the P53 uh, somehow prevents the proper uh, presentation of box one so we can interact. But at least it's worth speculating that perhaps the RNA protein interaction was there before the protein protein interaction. I'm not sure David Lane's going to like that. But all, right. all right, so now we switch from uh, MDM2 and the DNA damage response. And we're going to uh, go into ER stress and see what the P53 mRNA is doing in this pathway. So uh, you have different types of stresses, as so oxidative stress and high protein synthesis or extracellular, like poor perfusion, low nutrients, low oxygen. That all triggers ER stress and, and causes the unfolded protein response. So in, we're looking at solid tumors here, and we, look, and we use the BIP chaperone as a marker for ER stress. We find... Uh, uh, triggering of ER stress in the in the in this in tumor cells adjacent to poor perfusion. This is a necrotic area, but also we see that in these areas is uh, predominantly uh, tumor cells which are positive for ER stress and not the uh, uh, surrounding cells. And even in the tumor cells, the heterogeneous expression. So the unfolded protein response is triggered then by BIP. Uh, a binding of this BIP chaperone, which normally controls these uh, three axes of the ER stress response. So when BIP binds the unfolded proteins, it's activate these three pathway, and together they're trying to restore the, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the levels of uh, mature and newly synthesized proteins, right? The increase in the chaperones and also increases uh, degradation of, of misfolded proteins. And one way of controlling protein synthesis is done by the PERC, which via phosphorylation of EF to alpha leads to general translation suppression. But some mRNAs, which are required for the ER stress repair, such as the um, ATF4, are actually induced by PERC activity. And the P53 m oh, sorry, yeah. So what we do is to we control the ER stress pathway in the cells by um, uh, affecting glycosylation using tunicamycin or the calcium flux with tapsigorotin. So P53 mRNA is an, is an ER stress responsive protein via PERC, because if we treat cells with the tapsigargin, we get an induction of this uh, P47 isoform, and this is prevented in the presence of a dominant negative PERC. It doesn't happen if we take out these RNA regions, right? So we're interested in to find out how, it, which is the signaling pathway whereby PERC activates P53, and Anand has found that it doesn't uh, depend on the EF2 alpha, which is the common pathway for perc mediated activation translation or suppression. So you see here that uh, in the presence of a dominant negative uh, or, or an EF2 alpha, which cannot be phosphorylated, you see that you prevent the induction of ATF4 in CHOP, but nothing happens with P P47. 
And in fact, instead, it's the uh, HRMPC1 RNA binding protein we're responsible. So high levels of HRMPC1 is sufficient to induce P47. And this does not happen with this triple mutant RNA, right? even by CRM, uh, HRMPC1 or Tapsigargan. And the reason for that is that this RNA doesn't bind HRMPC1. So Anand also managed to uh, identify the phosphorylation site on HRMPC1 by ATM, and he made a phosphometic mutation. You can see that that's sufficient to induce the binding. So this is, of course, very similar to in terms of MDMX, MDM2 binding, 53 mRNA. But here, what happens instead is that if you just focus on the first AUG and the second AUG here, that see that in the presence of a non-RNA binding HMPC1, the first, uh, uh, the first AUG is, is released, is free, is single-stranded, whereas the second AUG is cryptic. But in the presence of the phosphometic uh, HMPC1, it's the opposite. The first AUG becomes cryptic, and instead the second AUG becomes exposed. So in this case, we have an RNA binding protein binded to this RNA structure, but changing in such a way that you uh, control translation initiation. So this uh, isoform, uh, which lacks the first uh, transactivation domain, has a complete opposite effect as full length P53 on the cell cycle. So the full length P53 gives a nice G1 arrest. We have P21, as we all know, where 47 has no effect on the G1 phase of the cell cycle. And where the G2 is the other way around. Full length has no effect, but 47 gives a nice G2 arrest. So to, so to summarize this, uh, we induce the unfolded protein response, and then PERCs give a general mRNA translation attenuation to stop protein synthesis, help ER repair. We get induction of P47. That gives a G2 arrest, but it and requires the 14 c 3 protein. And we can also get apoptosis, but I'm not going to go into this. And this then helps to facilitate ER repair because in the G2 phase of the cell cycle, there's about a 30% lower amount of protein synthesis as compared to the other phases. And this whole G2RS depends on this P53 mRNA structure. So, okay, let's leave the P53 mRNA and just for the last couple of slides very quickly just show that the other mRNAs in the P53 pathway which are also required or also uh, play a role in switching P53 activity during different stresses. So we see that uh, in cells which are treated with doxorubicin on normal condition, we get an in induction of P21. We all know about this. But however, cells that are exposed to two stresses, both ER stress and, uh, and DNA damage, they fail to induce P uh, P21. And in fact, if you overexpress P53 in cells, you see that the induction of, of uh, of Tapsic organ actually lead to a reduction in P53, uh, P21 levels, excuse me. And the reason why the cells need to get rid of P21 is because P21 prevents P47 induced G2 arrest. And this is probably linked to an in reverse effect of P21 and 14C3 levels. So if you overexpress P21, you prevent uh, expression of 14.33 sigma. And this is on the level of 14.33 stability and is mediated by the COP1 E3 ligase. So because under conditions like in low perfusion, when the cells are subjected to ER stress and tumors, they cannot induce the, uh, P21 right, via DNA damage. That means that you get an additional pro-apoptotic effect because the cells will enter the replicative phase with the damaged genome. Okay? And this increase in uh, apoptosis you know, of double stress is prevented by overexpressing P21. And this suppression of P21 during stress is actually mediated by P53 itself via the coding sequence of the P53 mRNA. So here we have taken a uh, P21 coding sequence, we're taking out all the AUGs, we fuse it to GFP so we don't have to worry about stability. And we see that in presence of wild type P53, there's a reduction in expression most of these contracts, except one that just contains the 75 first nucleotides. So it's a quite large regions, making it unlikely that this is made by microRNA, and we're not trying to understand the structure of the mRNA underlying this suppression. 
And uh, we also find the same thing surprisingly in, in uh, more recent, also in MDM2. So there, in the presence of Tapsic argon, we have a P53 dependent suppression of MDM2. And if you use an exogenous MDM2 with the HA tag, we see we quite quite nice dose-dependent down the regulation of HMDM2. So again, it's just a coding sequence of MDM2. But under this condition, P22, uh, P53 will still induce MDM2 levels. So uh, we, this is work undergoing, but we're quite certain that this is on the level of MRI translation as well. So what we have here is that under just to summarize this, is that under uh, normal condition, this is induction of P21, we get the G2 arrest. And overexpression of P53, in our hands at least, and the DNA damage response resembles other, each other quite nicely. But under ER stress, it's the other way around. So we see that P53 via P47 actually prevent P21 levels, so low P21 levels, are required in order to increase 1433 expression. And now we see the same with MDM2. We don't know really why MDM2 is downregulated under this condition. Perhaps it has to do something with the metabolic pathway, which Laurent talked about. And so we see here the similarity between these two pathways and the role of the structure in the P53 mRNA. In the first part of the talk, I mentioned how the MDM2 and MDMX via phosphorylation of MDM2 controls the folding of the P53 mRNA. I didn't talk about the, the role of the nucleolus in this, but you get induction of P53 activity, P21, G1 arrest. However, in endoplasmic reticulum stress, we have another mechanism, another protein, again via the P53 mRNA, now exposing the P47 AUG, allowing P47 to be expressed. We get suppression of P21 instead, but activation of 1433 sigma and G2 arrest, and also suppression of MDM2. So our model, uh, for more broader that we start to work about, is that the specificity of translation on certain mRNA is probably, to some ex extent as well, is mediated by the coding sequence of the mRNA. So we have, uh, in the first signal, you have the RNA uh, signaling factor binding to the nascent RNA and changing the folding. And then you get an effector RNA protein which can control the rate of translation, but not only that, this protein-RNA interaction can also uh, mediate regulation of other non-translation uh, dependent effects. Okay, with that, thank you very much. I'll take questions. <laughs>